Good morning and welcome to Provincial Stroke Rounds. I'm Dorothy Burridge, the Regional Education Coordinator with the Central East Stroke Network. And today's presentation is titled Stroke in Young Adults, Causes, Consequences and Long-Term Outcomes, presented by Dr. Swartz. We had over 200 registrants for this webinar and we have many just continuing to join. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the CESN website as well as available through a link that will be provided in your follow-up email. There also is a handout for today as well as a certificate. They are both located in the handout section of the control panel and you're welcome to download them at this time. They will also be sent out in follow-up email. There will be opportunities throughout this presentation to pause and ask questions, so please consider your questions as we're moving forward, as well as some time at the end of the presentation to ask further questions. I would ask that you please complete the attendance form and the evaluation for this presentation. The evaluation, there is a link, um, SurveyMonkey link, as well as a QR code that's been circulated uh, and is part of the handout. Uh, we encourage you to do that as it helps OREG determine um, future topics that are helpful across the, the province. Um, before introducing our speaker, um, I'll just next slide, please, Dr. Schwartz. Mm -hmm. This is the evaluation, so you will see the Survey Monkey link there, uh, as well as the QR code. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Swartz. He is an associate professor at the University of Toronto and director of the Stroke Research Unit at Sunnybrook. His research focuses on improving acute stroke treatment, identifying and treating post-stroke comorbidities, and improving long-term outcomes after stroke, especially those related to vascular cognitive impairment. Clinically, he manages unique patient populations, including stroke in the young, stroke during pregnancy, and intracranial vascular disease. So it gives me pleasure to uh, introduce and thank Dr. Swartz for his presentation today. Thank you very much, Dorothy, and, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for attending, uh, well, even not so bright and early, but dim and early this morning. Um, so uh, hopefully this, yeah, it's around now that we can enjoy over a nice cup of coffee and uh, that will keep your interest and uh, hopefully answer a number of questions that you may have about stroke in young adults. Um, as Dorothy said, a reminder uh, to complete the evaluation. Um, I am disclosing that I have no uh, conflicts of interest. My personal salary support for research and my grants are all publicly funded. I don't actually have industry support for research or productive time. Um, and there was no industry involvement in the creation of this talk. Um, the Provincial Stroke Rounds Committee wants you to know uh, that they have mitigated bias as well by ensuring there was no industry involvement in the planning or educational content of this talk. So throughout the talk, we're going to be focusing on stroke in young adults and really trying to uh, hopefully convince you, if you're not already convinced, stroke is not just a geriatric disease. Uh, that there are many varied causes and wide range of outcomes for young adults with stroke, and we're going to explore those a little bit uh, and really focus on the importance of early assessment and treatment and aggressive long-term risk reduction for young adults and indeed for everybody with stroke. Um, as Dorothy said throughout the talk, uh, there will be moments where we'll be able to pause and address questions that come up in the chat or question section of the uh, GoToWebinar panel. Um, so please feel free to uh, liberally pepper me with questions. Um, so one of my, it's, these are supposed to be learning outcomes, so I'd phrase it that way, but one of my objectives is also to just entertain you with uh, photographs that I like, uh, that I've taken over the years. Um, so when you get to a random uh, photograph that you're looking at going, what does that have to do with what he's talking about? That's gonna be a good time to ask questions uh, or to make sure your questions are in the chat. There will also be occasional uh, photographs like this that just make me smile. So uh, what are we talking about today? We're talking about stroke in the young. So I want to take a moment and define our terms. So the first term in that phrase is stroke. So what is stroke? Stroke is a brain attack. Um, so you know we, we borrow liberally from the cardiologists. So we borrow their drugs, we borrow their clinical trial designs, 
Um, and in fact, we have to borrow the public health messaging too. Heart attacks hurt, so people call 911. We need to get the public to think that stroke is a brain attack, right? It's, what, is, what does that really mean? Well, it's a sudden neuronal damage that causes loss of specific brain functions. That's the umbrella definition of what defines a stroke, and that can be either a blood clot or ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, so rupture uh, and blood leaking through the blood-brain barrier. In round numbers, you got about 80 to 85% uh, ischemic and 15 to 20% hemorrhagic. It varies depending on the population. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and ischemic stroke involves a whole bunch of different types of causes, as does hemorrhagic stroke. We're gonna get into that in a little bit uh, as we talk about young adults with stroke. So as we're talking about what is a stroke and how common is a stroke, a uh, heart and stroke wants you to know that in Canada, someone has a stroke every nine minutes. There's over 60,000 strokes annually in Canada. Um, and of those, 15% um, are fatal. Now, the, the fatal numbers have been dropping over the last 10 to 15 years as we've been doing a better job at uh, both stroke prevention. So, for example, people taking anticoagulation with AFib uh, have not just fewer strokes, but also less severe strokes. Um, as we treat better with hemicraniectomies to save lives, or with endovascular therapy to treat the most severe large vessel occlusions, we're seeing uh, fatality numbers dropping, but that does mean that even more people are living with some degree of disability. And indeed, stroke is the leading cause of adult neurological disability worldwide, and the fourth leading cause of death. As we said, we're dropping as far as leading causes of death, so we're hoping to keep losing that. Um, and almost 50, 500,000 Canadians almost are living with the effects of stroke now. So we've defined stroke, and we've talked a little bit about what, what stroke is and how we define that. If we're talking about stroke in the young, we have to define young as well. So what is young? I personally, like uh, somewhere I, I vacillate between Oscar Wilde and Pablo Picasso, that youth is wasted on the young, or it takes a very long time to become young. And I think truth is probably a bit of both. Uh, I also like the optimistic view of Tom Robbins. It's really never too late to have a happy childhood. Uh, so philosophically, I think, you know, the youth is, a, is a, something that we should all continue to strive for. Physiologically and in the scientific literature, youth is often defined as that time where most people are somewhere between puberty and menopause. Um, so in the literature, you most commonly see young defined as somewhere between 15 to 18 on the lower bound and somewhere between 44 to 55 on the upper bound. There are papers that for ease of use take 65 um, and you know 65 and up is not younger and 65 and below is younger. Uh, so there's a huge variability in the scientific literature that is arguably as variable or more variable than the uh, you know more artistic literature. So depending on how you set your cutoffs, if you look at the 18 to 44 population, you're gonna get a much smaller percentage of all strokes. They're gonna be sort of a little more pure, classic young stroke. Uh, they're gonna have less of the typical diseases of aging, so the consequences of long-term hypertension and high cholesterol and diabetes. They're gonna have lower rates of cognitive impairment and so on. So the demographics and the incidence and the prevalence will depend on where you set your bound, 44, 54, 64, and so on. The risk factors and the consequences will vary by how you define young. So I'm just gonna take a moment, reflect on the bubble, and see if anybody has questions at this point, because there are some people that are uh, still joining in, we're all just waking up, uh, I'm checking in on the chat, I don't see any questions. Um, I'll give people a moment to type in uh, in the question area or the chat area. If they don't, we'll keep going, and there'll be more photos to give us moments of pause. So, you know, we've defined now stroke, and we've defined young. So how often does this really happen? Well, again, depending on where you put that boundary, somewhere between 3 to 20% of all strokes. Uh, the lower ranges are in that tighter group. If you go up to 64, it can be up to 20% of all strokes. And indeed, uh, I really like this statistic uh, that came from Ontario Prevalence of Brain Disorders. Um, so this is Ontario data. If you look at the population of 18 to 64, this is sort of that young adult presentation, young adult time range where we really think of 
we don't think of stroke as a predominant neurological disorder in that age group. A lot of people would stereotypically say, well, MS is a disease of that population. Well, interestingly, in the 18 to 64 age group, stroke is still more prevalent than MS. And of course, if you go in the over 65, it's way more prevalent than MS. Overall, uh, young adults, and this is really more defining the 18 to 45 age group, uh, the prevalence is somewhere between 10 and 20 per 100,000. Most uh, studies are kind of landing on around 10 per 100,000 is a round number uh, to keep in your head. Of those, and this varies a little bit depending on the population and the sample, roughly 50% ischemic, 20% uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, and 30% subarachnoid hemorrhage. And even within the 18 to 45 age group, the rates increase exponentially with age. Um, no matter sort of what sample you look at, um, age and surviving is a risk factor for stroke. Stroke rates in younger adults are increasing. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that might be. So one is uh, risk factors are increasing. So uh, type 2 diabetes in children is rising. Hypertension in young adults is rising. So as we have increasing metabolic syndrome risk factors, increasing obesity, uh, and in 2020, we're all suffering from increased sedentary lifestyles, um, we are seeing you know, corresponding rates uh, of stroke in young adults increasing in lockstep with those risk factors. The average age of stroke has been dropping over many years. And that is in part a reflection of these risk factor and demographic changes. It's may be influenced by more people in the at-risk age group and by our um, greater awareness talks like this. People are uh, imaging uh, acutely, uh, doing, you know, using MRI, uh, because there are coding incentives to label people as stroke, especially in the US, but even in Canada, there are, you know, stroke pathways and non-stroke pathways where funding and remuneration is tied to making the diagnosis. So. Uh, there's an interesting discussion of, of that in this paper uh, about you know, some of the non-physiological biases that may be leading to this. But I, I think if you look at, at the literature uh, in, in multiple different settings, in multiple different uh, circumstances, I think there is some plausible um, biology with the increasing risk factors. And there's a lot of consistency which suggests that there is probably a true increase in addition to potentially some identification bias. In Canada, specifically, if you look at Canadian data, uh, we recently published uh, Aru Kapoor, is a former master's student of mine who uh, has been a, extremely productive and is now off uh, in the US, although living in Vancouver, but doing a, uh, her PhD in psychology uh, as a clinical neuroscientist. Um, but we just recently published this paper uh, along with uh, Heart and Stroke and Patrice Lindsay. Um, and, uh, the rest of our co-authors from the Canadian Journal of Neurological Sciences, looking at the way in which young people access the system. So we know that younger adults are less likely to arrive by ambulance. Ambulance use has not increased in younger women. We don't know why, because we do see these trends in older women, older men, and younger men. So over the last 13 years, 2003 to 2016, which is the, the earliest or the latest, rather, we can get the administrative data, ambulance use did grow. Younger women, for some reason, did not. Um, younger patients also come to hospital later after stroke onset by a median of an hour and a half, which, as you know, time is brain. That's a huge difference. Um, and younger females specifically wait the longest. So again, older men and older women uh, both come in relatively quickly. I think stroke awareness, the awareness of signs and symptoms, the knowing of somebody else who had a stroke, the hearing the story of how you have to get in quickly to get access to treatment. There's a little more uh, awareness of that in the zeitgeist of the population uh, over 65 and over 45. Um, in younger women, uh, it seems to be taking more time to uh, sort of become aware. And I'm not sure if that's again because there's a sort of stereotype that stroke is a disease of older people and or a disease of men, um, but we need to do a better job of educating younger women that stroke can happen to younger women too, um, because they're uh, not using ambulances as much, they're not calling them as quickly. And so this is a, a 
a bias in our system and a bias in our public's uh, view, our own view of identifying it. Indeed, in, in, this, in this study, we saw that younger adults, remember I suggested that less than 45, you're around 3%, so the Canadian data is right in line with that 3.9% of all strokes were in individuals 18 to 45. Uh, we had a higher rate of bleeds, and again, this is what we mentioned earlier, around you know, 50% ischemic, 30% ICH, 20% subarachnoid, and so that's exactly what we saw. And we said overall, women are less likely to use the ambulance, especially younger women. Um, even if they do come to an emergency room, the diagnosis could be delayed or indeed missed. There may not be any vascular risk factors. There are many more common presentations that can mimic the symptoms of stroke, like migraine aura or toxicity. Uh, a horrible case that I was involved with as a resident, I showed up to work one morning and got called by eMERGE to come see a patient who had come in the night before uh, from a bar, 22-year-old, um, not speaking, they thought he was drunk, so they let him sleep it off. And then in the morning, they, when he woke up, they thought maybe this is not drunk because he hasn't improved at all. And indeed, we went to see him, and he was aphasic, and he had a massive left hemispheric stroke. Um, but he was 22 years old in a bar, so it's very easy to think, well, he's speaking confusedly because he's drunk too much. Um, you know, a 22-year-old coming from a bar stroke is not necessarily your first thought. There may be many more or less obvious causes. So in somebody who doesn't have risk factors, you know, we medicine is very Bayesian. And when you start to get those, uh, those additional risk factors, you hear, you know, 85-year-old male smoker, hypertensive, high cholesterol, diabetes, you're already kind of moving into that something happened to their blood vessels, heart and stroke, and you know, you're already thinking in that way. When you hear a 24-year-old woman with no vascular risk factors um, presents with numbness on the left side, you're thinking about migraine, you're thinking about MS, you're thinking about all sorts of things, maybe stroke is much lower on the diagnosis. Uh, so even physicians think of stroke as a disease of the elderly because, as we said, 18 to 44 is four percent of all strokes in Canada. So 96 percent of what physicians are seeing is people over 45. So common things being common, uh, people just have a bit of an identification bias and, and miss it. So it can be confusing, indeed somewhat dizzying, uh, to make sense of and get an approach to stroke in the young. And that's really what we're going to try to do in the next section of the talk, is to kind of descend uh, a little bit into the particulars. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to keep going, but feel free to jump in. So how do we approach stroke in young adults? This is one of my favorite Shakespeare quotes ever. Uh, there are more things in heaven and earth ratio than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Um, these photos are an example of our natural philosophy and uh, what we call science. Um, and they all represent uh, different versions uh, of the same concept. And the same concept uh, that I'm really trying to get at here is uh, chaos theory. It's this, this idea that there is an underlying order in things that seem random. And that order gets reflected in nature over and over and over again. And there are patterns if you know how to find them. And so we're going to look at those patterns in stroke in young adults. So the largest study to date was the Helsinki Young Stroke Registry, about 1,000 patients aged 15 to 49. You see here again that variability of age range that we were talking about earlier. They looked at uh, etiologies by modified TOS criteria. So large artery atherosclerosis, clots in the carotid or vertebral uh, arteries, cardioembolic, which is a big category that involves multiple different causes. So that could be atrial myxomas, and that could be um, valvular excrescences, and that can be PFOs or vent, uh, ventricular septal defects or all sorts of things. So congenital cardiac anomalies, all of that gets lumped into that 20% cardioembolism. Small vessel lacunar strokes about 14%. And then the biggest, the most common cause of stroke in young adults is unknown. Uh, so I often say in my clinic, right, the most common cause of stroke is, oh, um, about a third of all strokes in young adult, we can't ascribe to a traditional uh, category 
of stroke etiology because they don't have risk factors. Um, and so it becomes idiopathic or cryptogenic or thesis and lots of different terms. Just the mere fact that we have so many names for it tells you that we don't really get it. Um, interestingly, the single most common individual etiology for stroke in young adults is dissection, um, accounting for 15% of strokes in young adults. So, you know, cardioembolism is a, high, is a bigger uh, cause as a group, but that's made up of so many different uh, individual causes. Dissection, so tears in the carotid or vertebral arteries, whether from trauma or spontaneous, account for 15% of strokes in this age group. And then miscellaneous is a large group as well. Indeed, uh, here is a, a series of, of a few different cohorts um, with the CGNS cohort in 2000 being Canadian data. And you can see most of them, you know, they all have slightly different numbers, but cardioembolic is very common. Dissection is the most common single cause. Uh, miscellaneous is very frequent, and somewhere between a quarter to almost a half of all strokes uh, fall into the oh, category uh, in, this, in this age group. And part of that is because they haven't had the, the time to accumulate the risk factors, the injuries to the small vessel or large vessel. Uh, so you can't sort of lump somebody in small vessel disease if they haven't had a lacunar stroke and they don't have you know, 10 years of hypertension or high cholesterol or other things behind them. So that gets left in the, we're not sure what happened. And if we dig deeper, um, we'll start to see that the etiologies, even within the young age category, vary. So the closer to the older end you get, the more small vessel and large vessel athero you see, and the less of the undetermined or rare causes that you see. At least a third will be undetermined, and the older you get, the more people end up fitting in a large vessel or small vessel box, so you have fewer undetermines. Um, the other miscellaneous is often where actually I live in my clinic. I see a lot of stroke in young adults, and I've seen every single one of these. I have multiple people with most of these in my clinic. Um, so whether it's venous sinus thrombosis, whether it's antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, lupus, or other vasculitides, whether it's uh, you know pregnancy-related complications like eclampsia, HELP syndrome, cerebral, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis in pregnancy, peripartum cardiomyopathies, RCVS, the reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. Uh, I see a lot of moya moya disease, which is a obliterative vasculopathy that we have no idea why it happens. Uh, so these intracranial vascular diseases can be really interesting. Uh, connective tissue diseases. Um, I think actually now I have every one of these, including now I don't have it on the list, but uh, this is MELAS, but other mitochondrial diseases. There's CATASIL, which is an autosomal dominant disease uh, that's a genetic disease. There's also CARASIL, which is the autosomal recessive version. Um, seem to have picked up my first uh, complex patient who has a CARASIL gene mutation that's expressing as CATASIL, which is really interesting. Um, so you you see much more varied causes of stroke in young adults. An interesting point though, these causes of stroke, I mean obviously not the pregnancy causes, but a lot of these causes can still affect older people, over 45, even over 65. Uh, it's just that they get so dramatically drowned out by atrial fibrillation, large vessel and small vessel atherosclerosis, that they become a less and less and less and less frequent occurrence and you get more and more of the more classic causes of stroke. I'm gonna take a moment and just zoom in on stroke in pregnancy um, because it's a very specific subgroup of people. Most pregnancies uh, are fine, so if there's anybody who knows somebody who's pregnant in the audience, don't panic. Um, about a third uh, of the time in pregnancy when there is a stroke, they're ischemic, about a third of the time they're hemorrhage, about a third of the time venous sinus thrombosis in round numbers. The risk is the highest immediately peripartum and in the first six weeks postpartum. We can get into that if people have questions about why that might be. Uh, we, we did a meta-analysis, my group did a meta-analysis uh, a couple of years ago uh, and looked at uh, the overall rates in multiple populations, looked at similarities and differences and why the, the rates varied uh, across different populations. And the crude rates, uh, when we combine everything in the meta-analysis, is roughly 30 per 100,000. Recall that generally in stroke in young adults, it's about 10 per 100,000. 
So the relative risk in pregnancy is about three times. So it's a threefold risk. That's a high relative risk, but remember the absolute risk is still low. So there's 900, uh, sorry, 99,970 out of 100,000 will not have a stroke. So 30 out of 100,000 is still a very low absolute risk. It's just a high relative risk. And you see that rough rule of thirds reflected in our meta-analysis when we did cause specific, uh, when we looked just at the studies where they detailed the causes, it was roughly equal about 12 per 100,000 ischemic, 12 per 100,000 hemorrhagic, and just less than that for venous sinus thrombosis. So it's common enough that most people encounter it, uh, but rare enough that few people develop a lot of expertise with it. And so at Sunnybrook, we have a very high volume and high risk labor and delivery service. Uh, so we see a fair bit of it, and we've kind of concentrated that expertise. And Orla Danny is a high risk of, uh, obstetrician who I work closely with. And over the years, and especially after doing the meta-analysis, we, we decided to bring together a group of experts, uh, along with uh, Patty Lindsay and Heart and Stroke, uh, through the Canadian Stroke Best Practice uh, framework, to try to develop uh, statements. So these aren't even recommendations, because the literature is complex. There's not a lot of you know, randomized controlled trials of women uh, who have strokes in pregnancy. And we really tried to uh, pull together the literature uh, that exists about uh, pregnancy, so the literature on blood pressure in pregnancy and aspirin in pregnancy for other conditions. And we pulled together the literature in stroke, and we pulled together experts to come up uh, to, to sort of assemble a philosophy of how to manage patients with, uh, with stroke in pregnancy, uh, so uh, sort of the, the general approach, as well as really specific recommendations on neuroimaging, and blood pressure, and statins, and uh, thrombolysis, and uh, EBT, and so on. So we divided it up eventually into two categories. Um, and so there's the acute stroke management in pregnancy and the secondary stroke prevention during pregnancy. And roughly each of these divide into uh, two different categories. So in the acute stroke management, we're really focusing on women who were pregnant and developed neurology or developed stroke issues. In the secondary prevention, it's women who had stroke issues and wanted to get pregnant or found themselves pregnant. And so uh, the first one really either their experience a stroke during the pregnancy or early in the postpartum period. In the prevention, uh, there's this sort of two subcategories of people with a history of stroke who want to become pregnant and are doing prospective planning or who uh, actually kind of find themselves pregnant and then realize that they or their doctors realize, wait a minute, Maybe we need to think about this because they've had this history and does that change anything? Uh, so I have a clinic uh, where I see stroke in pregnancy and we talk about sort of, uh, we see patient, patients sort of in all of these scenarios uh, on a regular basis. And uh, pulling together the literature, pulling together the, the experts kind of grew out of, out of that clinical focus with, with, that pregnant, with, with that clinic, that stroke and pregnancy clinic. Um, and we, we have for a long time been uh, doing that clinic uh, even virtually for people, uh, you know, further out of Toronto. Um, and so the, the current pandemic is uh, was a fairly easy adaptation because we were already doing it at least one day a month uh, where we'd offer virtual clinics for people coming from far away for vasculitis or pregnancy related uh, intracranial vasculopathy type issues. So uh, yeah, just uh, just warning that, that once they come out uh, after the pregnancy, they grow up quick. So uh, this, is, this is what happens. So I'm going to take a moment here and pause. I see one question in the chat. Uh, what is the chance of a patient who presents with TIA symptoms turning to stroke within 24 hours? Um, so we can answer that in two ways. Um, if you look at it um, with uh, sort of the ABC2 type risk factor, so it does depend a little bit on what their symptoms are, those presenting with motor speech TIAs, uh, have higher risk. Those who present with slightly longer duration of symptoms have higher risk. Um, and so the, the roughly the risk of stroke in the first 24 hours is about half the risk of stroke in the first 90 days. It's very front loaded. And we just published an, another paper actually in CGNS uh, just last week it came out uh, looking at trends over time in stroke after TIA throughout Ontario showing that we are doing a good job, not just in regional stroke centers, but at a population level, 
of reducing the frequency of recurrent stroke and the mortality. So I'll point you to that paper, uh, CJNS, Canadian Journal of Neurological Sciences, just came out uh, in November, December 2020. Um, and in general terms, that, that those numbers are dropping. In young adults, uh, there is still a risk of stroke uh, after TIA. It is slightly lower than in the older adult population, uh, but TIA is still a warning sign, and that risk of stroke, depending on your risk factors, uh, in those first 24 hours can be as low as a few percent and as high as 30 percent, depending on your risk factors and your, uh, your presentation. So we also have a question related to the risk of stroke during pregnancy when a woman has already had a stroke during a previous pregnancy. Yeah, so it, this is a really problematic question. We don't have great data in the literature. Uh, most of my patients who have had a history of prior stroke uh, do not have recurrences. So there's very few cohorts that have followed people with a prior history of stroke through pregnancy a second time. And I actually looked at this, we wanted to look at this with data in ISIS, and even the entire population of Ontario with 14 million people followed longitudinally is too small to actually uh, reliably answer the question. So if you think about 30 per 100,000, um, so if, if the risk is the same as the general population, so you're, uh, of pregnant women, so you have 30 per 100,000 for the risk of the first stroke. If it's the same in the second stroke, then you need 100,000 women with prior, with prior strokes getting pregnant and following them through their pregnancy to find 30 new strokes. If it's higher or lower, you, you might need even more. And so we don't even have the numbers with 14 million people. 14 million people does not mean 14 million pregnant women. So the, the registry in our administrative data sets is even smaller. Roughly speaking, the way I approach this is I take the uh, what we know about um, recurrence risks of stroke and what we know about pregnancy. So if, let's say, uh, you have a young adult who's had a stroke spontaneously um, and they, they don't fit into any of those categories, they're in the cryptogenic category or they're in one of the categories that has like dissection or PFO that has like a 1% or 2% recurrence risk in general. We know that, so, so that's the baseline recurrence risk not pregnant, one or two percent. We know that in the general population, pregnancy increases the risk from 10 per 100,000 to 30 per 100,000, as I mentioned before, so roughly a threefold risk. So what I do when I'm evaluating risk is I say it's a logical assumption that if their risk outside of pregnancy of recurrence because of their stroke etiology is one or two percent, then within pregnancy, the, the, worst, the, the worst case scenario would be a risk around three to 6%. So I just apply that threefold risk to their baseline stroke recurrence risk from their etiology. And so if they have a higher risk stroke etiology, then their risk in pregnancy is higher. Uh, in my personal experience, it's not even that high. Um, I've seen women with moya moya through pregnancies. I've seen women with vasculitis through pregnancies, I've seen women with dissections through pregnancies, I've seen women with venous sinus thrombosis through pregnancies, um, and I have, you know, I've probably followed a uh, hundred women through pregnancies easily, and and we have not had, thankfully, uh, a high rate of, of recurrences. But in a worst case scenario, when we're planning, uh, that's kind of how we the, the thinking that I use to risk titrate. And so, if the risk uh, in pregnancy is you know three percent or higher then we might be thinking about anticoagulation um because that would uh carry you know a complication risk that's that's lower than that were there other questions Dorothy? yes so there's just a couple other related to pregnancy um one is why are strokes in pregnancy especially evident in the postpartum and also is the risk higher in c-section versus natural Mm -hmm. And would you administer TPA to an expecting mother? Mm. Okay, so again, for further reading, um, I'll, I'll refer you to the, the two guidelines. Um, I'm going to try to answer the three questions. Uh, so as far as TPA to an expectant mother, uh, before we had EVT, 
Um, we did. It's, it's happened in handfuls of cases, case reports. I've had experience in a couple of cases. Uh, but it was really a Hail Mary in patients who had severe large vessel occlusions that we didn't have a treatment for years ago. Um, as we've had endovascular therapy, our preference for those most severe, most disabling, most, most life-threatening strokes uh, has changed. And so we take them preferentially to the cath lab. Uh, thrombolysis can be an option. Uh, but it's an option that has to be discussed very carefully um, with uh, the patient if they're capable, with substitute decision makers if they're not. It's a very stressful conversation. It usually should be done multidisciplinarily. Uh, so this is, again, that philosophy of how to handle uh, stroke in pregnancy. And we really do believe that it's best handled in team uh, and best handled at, at least with the advice and guidance of people with some comfort and expertise in addressing these issues. So um, I would be happy to give a whole other talk on the management of stroke and pregnancy um, because there's a lot of meat here to go into. Um, but but as, a, as a rough sort of first pass answer, yes, you can do it. It's done very rarely, there are risks. Um, so the, sorry, the other questions, uh, Dorothy, um, why are stroke and pregnancy more common um, especially in the postpartum period? Well, there, there's a number of answers for that, but, but fundamentally, again, this is an entire talk on its own, um, but one of the key things is that women's bodies are really, have evolved um, to clot after pregnancy so that they don't hemorrhage. Uh, one of the big causes of maternal morbidity and mortality is bleeding uh, postpartum. So. Uh, there is, uh, you know, all sorts of things are happening with the uterus and contracting and blood vessels trying to constrict and contract so that as the placenta uh, is delivered and the placenta is basically tearing away from the uterine wall, there can be bleeding there. Um, the idea is to stop that bleeding. If it's massive, it can cause even fatal hemorrhage. And so uh, the humanity, we as a species, have evolved to develop mechanisms where around the time of birth, there's an upregulation of clotting factors, um, and uh, sort of a woman's body goes into a bit of a predisposed state to staunch the bleeding, which is a good thing. Overall, that does more good than harm, but it can increase the risk of heart and stroke complications, um, especially DVT, pulmonary embolism, and stroke. Um, there's also changes to total body water um, and and you know concentration, hemoconcentration. Um, so there's a lot of things going on, but, but in, a, in a short answer, uh, that's the reason why peripartum and the first six weeks postpartum are the highest stress time. After that, the body is kind of resetting um, and going back into a more normal sort of menstrual pattern, um, or if breastfeeding, sometimes the uterine bleeding isn't happening, uh, but the clotting factors are, are sort of more stable. Um, and then is, is C-section a higher risk than vaginal delivery? Uh, in general, C-section is a higher risk than vaginal delivery for uh, all complications. Um, and stroke is a very small signal in that. So C-section is not a major risk for stroke per se, um, but there is more, more uh, rates of complications sort of overall for the, for the woman with C-section than without. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, our obstetricians at Sunnybrook and our high-risk OBs do a lot of assisted vaginal deliveries um, where there, if we don't want a woman pushing, say there's an unruptured aneurysm or they have a history of bleeding or they have a history of ischemic stroke with dissection and we don't want extra strain on the artery, so we don't want them, you know, Valsalva pushing, heaving for long periods of time, uh, we may do this as assisted uh, delivery where they're given medications to increase contractions and they use uh, forceps or vacuum to help get the baby out in, in, the, in that second stage of delivery um, to reduce the need for C-section. So as a neurologist, I always say that I'm the mummy doctor, not the tummy doctor. Uh, so I won't make the decisions. I'll never recommend a C-section or require it. I don't want to paint the woman uh, or the obstetrician into a corner. Um, so I think I've addressed those questions. Um, I think we'll, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll keep going um, and, and I, we will have opportunities for questions uh, again. So what about acute stroke treatment? We talked about it in pregnancy. What about in general in young adults? Well, 
the same thing we do in, uh, in, in everybody else. We rule out bleeds, we thrombolyze, uh, we give uh, EVT if they have large vessel occlusions, uh, we control their blood pressure, we reverse coagulopathies if they're bleeding, we give them uh, access to stroke units and all that other good stuff. And for, for details, I would refer you to the stroke best practices hyperacute chapter uh, that has recently been uh, updated. Um, but suffice to say that young patients get at least as much benefit, if not more, uh, as older patients from both thrombolysis and endovascular interventions. And just as an aside, uh, my colleague BJ Menon and I are running a national clinical trial called the ACT trial, Alteplase compared to Tenecteplase. So I hope uh, to be able to come back and give you guys a talk in a year or two, uh, and we can stop talking about TPA and start talking about Tenecteplase, but in general, we'll talk about thrombolysis. Uh, and in this context, young adults get as much benefit from thrombolysis and endovascular interventions, or potentially more, but at least as much, and from stroke unit care as older individuals. In young people, especially early decompressive hemicraniectomy, it has to be a large decompression. Small decompressions don't do it. If you're going to relieve space, you have to relieve a lot of space. Uh, so in people for, who have large vessel occlusions who can't get endovascular interventions or for whom those interventions are not successful, uh, hemicraniectomy can improve both mortality and long-term functional outcomes. Secondary prevention in young adults is important. We need to treat underlying conditions. We need to treat vascular risk factors. They will likely get even more benefit from blood pressure reduction and lifestyle and smoking cessation because there's a much longer time horizon uh, as you kind of tweak those curves, those survival curves separate even more than they can uh, with, with older people. Universal use of statins is controversial in young adults. If you have your stroke because of a dissection, do you really need a statin? I get a lot of patients asking me that. Um, the truth is we don't have great data to guide those discussions. Um, but there was, uh, young patients were included in the SPARKLE trial and there was a, a study uh, of people who stayed on statins for 10 years or more, and they did have fewer and less severe strokes. It was an observational study, lots of potential for biases. I won't get into it in detail, but if people have questions, we can talk about it later. Um, the RESPECT trial was negative, uh, so DOACs have not been shown to be beneficial in young adults um, with cryptogenic or ESIS stroke at this point. Um, other questions, Dorothy, or should I, can I keep going? Uh, there was one question, and I'm not sure you're going to, if you're going to come to this or not, but if you could comment on the incidence of stroke in younger patients with COVID. Um, I can come to that maybe at the end. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, I want to, we'll get through a little bit more, and then, then we'll come back to that. So it's a really interesting question. Um, we're, we're, we're still, the short answer is we're still getting our heads around the incidence of stroke in everybody in COVID, uh, and the young population, we don't have a lot of data on. We're, we're starting to look at it. Um, when we look at long-term outcomes, there was a, a study of a couple thousand patients uh, where almost 90% had a good outcome. Uh, the older you get, as we said before, the, the more sort of leaks into more traditional stroke outcomes. So the odds of a good outcome decline by three to four percent every decade. Um, the Helsinki data that I had shown you earlier with a thousand patients suggests a mortality of less than three percent at one month. But this is young adults, 5% almost by one year and 11% at five years. These are people who do not, should not have that kind of elevated one in five year mortality outside of having a stroke. So something about the stroke or the risk factors for stroke is driving a significant increase in mortality. Um, risk factors, not surprisingly, the more risk factors you have, the higher the mortality. Um, I'm part of a Global Outcome Assessment Lifelong After Stroke, the GOAL initiative. It's a multi-center, multinational, retrospective, individual patient data meta-analysis. So we're going back to cohorts that we've each collected in, in populations around the world and trying to combine them to get the largest sample that we can of young adults to really look at outcomes. Um, dissection as one etiology has a very low death rate. Recurrence is about 2% in the first year and 1% per year thereafter. Venous sinus thrombosis is also is quite bimodal. Um, there's a 15% fatality or severe disability, um, but those that survive tend to do well. So a 75 to 80% make a complete recovery. Um, acute ischemic stroke, is, as I was alluding to earlier, there is a there are a couple of papers suggesting that young adults might do even better with, with thrombolysis than older. 
those without recurrence, uh, without risk factors have fewer recurrence strokes, fewer other arterial events like cardiac and lower mortality overall. If you've had a, a prior TIA or a history of silent brain arm infarct seen on MRI, that increases the risk. So it's kind of not surprising. The more times you've had it, the more times you're going to get it. So what happens down the road? The risk of stroke does not stop at 90 days. Um, a lot of times we just focus on those first 90 days because that's where the steep part of the curve is. Um, but you can see it's kind of a general long lingering decline. So we looked at this uh, a postdoc in my lab who's now many of you may know uh, in Ottawa, uh, Jody Edwards. Uh, we looked at almost 40,000 people discharged after stroke or TIA, and we excluded anybody for whom anything happened in the first 90 days. Hospitalization, stroke, MI, death, institutionalization. If they came back to hospital for as much as a stubbed toe, they were excluded. And we looked at the remaining 70% of people who were fully stable for 90 days. So we got rid of that early stroke recurrence, ABCD2, early, early stroke after TIA. And we looked at the remaining 26,000 people about two-thirds stroke, one-third TIA, most of them on the mild side. So these are young adults, or, sorry, this is everybody, excuse me, and we matched these 26,000 patients 10 to 1 uh, with controls in the Ontario population by age, sex, geography, and income quintile. And we showed that in all comers, all ages, the combined outcome of recurrent stroke, death, MI or hospitalization occurred in 10% of people in the first year after the high-risk period was over and in 34% by five years. And if you look compared to controls, even up to five years, that, that risk is doubled. Um, so twice the risk of morbidity, if you look at the individual outcomes, twice the risk of mortality, three times the risk of admission to long-term care, and seven times the risk of recurrent stroke that remain elevated for at least five years, that was as long as we could look, um, when you compare those with stroke to those with that, that's in everybody. We did another study that was published in JAHA, in the Journal of American Heart Association last year, um, looking at younger adults compared to younger controls versus older adults compared to older controls. For the purposes of this study, we used the 45-year-old cutoff, and we said, and we found that that composite outcome occurred in 2.2% of the young adults, even after they survived that highest risk 90-day period. Um, and the interesting thing is the aggregate risk is 2% in the first year and about 1% per year thereafter. So at five years, it's a total 7% risk. Compared to matched controls, it's five times the risk. So young adults who haven't had stroke have a very low risk of stroke. It's high at one year and remains high for five years. So my patients ask me like, oh, it's been, it's been a few years. Is my risk kind of coming back down to what it would be if I had never had a stroke? And unfortunately, the answer is no. We need to keep people on long-term risk reduction. We need to keep people eating healthy. We need to keep them not smoking. We need to keep them exercising. We need to keep them uh, with their blood pressure under good control. We need to keep them in antithrombotics because their risks continue as far as we, we haven't been able to follow them for longer than five years because of the limitations of administrative data sets uh, to get large enough samples, but the risk for me in five times that appears out to five years. In contrast, if you look at the older population, and this is partly because the risk in the controls is so much higher, uh, those with a stroke are at about 30%, not a, not a 500%, a 30% increase. Um, so, what about those who have good outcomes? So we, this is uh, Aru Kapoor again, uh, did a study uh, out of her master's thesis where she was looking at long-term outcomes more than two and a half years after stroke. And she found that 68% uh, had an excellent outcome, what we define as an excellent outcome. Their modified Rankin score was zero to one. So really no significant disability, not requiring walking aids, um, independent, um, and either no disability or a minimal disability not interfering with day-to-day -day activities. But in that excellent outcome group, MRS of 0-1, which is the outcome from all our clinical trials, 50% of them had a MOCA of less than 26, so some evidence of potential cognitive impairment. Half of them were not fully reintegrated to their activities from before their stroke. 30% were both cognitively impaired and had restrictions in their day-to-day -day activities. 30%, 32% endorsed symptoms of depression, and 20, almost 20% had not gone back to work. This is our excellent outcome. 
younger patients tended to have less cognitive impairment, not shocking, but interestingly, more symptoms of depression. So almost a quarter of young adults with stroke, two and a half years after their stroke, a quarter of them are still struggling with symptoms, with symptoms of depression. Again, they're less often impaired on day-to-day -day activities of daily living, 25% versus 51% in the, in the over 65 category. But there was no difference in restrictions returning to work. So young people, almost a third of them are not returning to work even after two and a half years. So it's a major cost personally to their finances and society. We actually did a systematic review in part based on her work in that other study. She became interested in that literature and she and Jody teamed up uh, on a systematic review of return to work. And we looked at younger patients. So here, just because this is how we could access most of the literature, in this literature, it seems to be divided less than 65 and over 65 because over 65 retire. So looking at younger patients under 65, they return to work gradually. About 40% are back to work within six months. Two thirds are back to work. This is kind of really matches what Aru found in our, in our study locally. Um, about two thirds are back to work between two and four years. So a third of people, even up to two to four years, are not back to work. The more independent they are in ADLs, the less the neurological deficits and the less the cognitive deficits, the more likely they are to get back to work. There are interventions that improve function, TPA, stroke unit care, probably EBT, but we don't have evidence for that yet, have been shown to increase return to work. Younger men return to work more often than younger women. Office and white collar workers return more often than blue collar workers or manual laborers. Uh, and individualized workplace interventions, vocational training, uh, in some small studies has been shown to actually increase the ability of people to get back to work. So there's things we can do to help people get back to work. I'm going to just push through to the end and maybe we'll save the last questions for the last couple of minutes because we only have a few minutes left. And I want to talk about post-stroke complications. We know that people after stroke, and this is another talk I'm happy to give about screening for depression, obstructive sleep apnea, cognitive impairment, um, People can have difficulty communicating, gait mobility challenges, risk of falls, continence challenges, seizure, seizure risks, and these load on to return to work. They load on to driving. There's an asterisk there because this is the bane of my existence in clinic. We spend lots and lots of time worrying about driving and writing letters and uh, helping people get back to driving. There's financial pressure for those that can't get to work. There's relationship issues when partners become caregivers. Um, in young uh, families, this affects parenting decisions. Birth control has to be considered. What are the risks, for example, of birth control and increasing clot risk? Um, even how people feel when they're numb or weak on one side, how that affects their sexuality, how that affects their relationship with their partners. Um, the metaphysical struggles uh, about why me, but also can I parent? How do I parent? What should I do? Um, there's a lot of things to consider. A, a number of years ago, back when Heart and Stroke Foundation had a different logo, um, we, uh, through uh, the U of T uh, Neurology Division, uh, some of my students, we, uh, with the help of the Canadian Partnership for Stroke Recovery and Heart and Stroke, we put together this guidebook uh, on stroke in young adults. It's a resource for patients and families. Um, it has all sorts of uh, what I hope is helpful information. It has quotes and you know, even photographs of volunteers who, who wanted their stories told, who agreed to contribute. Um, it's an ebook. It's available online. Just search Stroke in the Young Guidebook, um, and it's free to download. I don't get any royalties from this or anything. It's really something we just put together uh, to try to help the conversation, to try to bring awareness uh, to an issue because, as we've talked about it from the beginning of this talk, um, people hear a lot about stroke in the older population. But stroke is not just a geriatric disease. It impacts across the lifespan. Young adults are a sizable minority of stroke patients and we need to think about it. The causes of stroke in young adults are very complex and in a third of the cases, we actually don't know the cause, which just tells you how much more we have to learn. And stroke is not just an acute event. Uh, especially in our young adults, there's long-term risks, as we highlighted, about the recurrent strokes and uh, mortality even, um, but there's also these long-term complications like depression, like challenges returning to work, like challenges driving. And so these have a big social impact and a big personal impact. Having an organized approach to the causes, investigations, treatment, and prevention is vital 
Uh, holistic approach to the person and the impact of the event are really important for helping patients and families, uh, partners, um, caregivers live well after their stroke. Ongoing long-term vascular risk reduction is needed uh, because the risks never really go back to what they were. And we need to do more research in this. We need to improve the outcomes. So um, I'm some a lot of the data I was showing you came out. You saw a lot of uh, Edwards and Kapoor's work. Um, a team uh, who's helped with the doc study. I've benefited from my students and my collaborators a lot, as well as from uh, public support from my funders. And I just want to thank them and thank you for your time. And we'll, with the last five minutes, we'll take some questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Swartz, for an extremely interesting, informative, and, and very important talk. Um, we do have a couple of additional questions here. Uh, and this pertains to your talk about reintegrating, returning to work. And the question is, are you concerned with things like reintegration into work and society with this population under the pandemic umbrella? Um, they're struggling with a young client in their community trying to, to get them back to work with all the restrictions in place. Yeah, it complicates an already complicated discussion, no question. Um, the risk of COVID, so this, this actually gets to one of the other questions that I sort of bookmarked later. Um, COVID in its severe forms uh, does seem to be associated with some hypercoagulability, so risk of forming clots uh, when people are, uh, you know, severely affected. It may, even in the minimally symptomatic uh, or asymptomatic cohorts, also be associated with risk of clots. And this is still an evolving literature, um, so I don't want to overcommit, uh, but I think there is a signal there that it could. So what does that mean for our patients? Does that mean everybody who's had, anybody who's had a stroke shouldn't be out ever? Well, that's probably a little excessive. Uh, does it mean that they are at increased risk if they get COVID? Maybe. So I don't think they're at any increased risk of contracting COVID than the general population. As somebody who's already has a tendency to form clots, could they be at higher risk uh, of, of bad outcomes if they got COVID? Maybe. I don't think there's enough data to say that yet. Um, so what I am telling my patients is you absolutely need to do the things that everybody should be doing. You need to wear a mask, you need to wash your hands, uh, you need to minimize contact. So really, especially right now, as the outbreak is getting uh, in that sort of control range in the second wave, uh, you know, really not being in the same house or going out to dinner or those kinds of things with, with other people. When it comes to getting them back to work, this is really complicated. So what is their work? Are they going to, are they an essential worker? Are they, you know, if they're a frontline healthcare worker or they're, a, you know, a waiter in a restaurant where they're face to face with people in indoors capacities um, versus getting back to work in a, you know, an office that's at, you know, 10% capacity with two other people separated by, you know, 500 meters um, versus working from home. Um, there, so am I concerned with getting them back to work? Yes. Um, and we really have to weigh those risks and benefits, the risk of exposure to COVID, the risk of a bad complication, were they to get COVID, the risk of not working. So uh, I have young people who, you know, are at risk of homelessness or not having food on the table if they can't work. And that has health consequences. Uh, they can't afford their medications, that has health consequences. So, um, you know, especially those without benefits, those with precarious employment, it, it gets very complex. So I hope I tried to answer two at once there. Thank you. Um, we are at nine o'clock, so uh, we are going to need to end these rounds. There are some additional comments that I can let you look in the question box after, and, and those thanking you for your participation and for your kids also participating in the presentation. Uh, so thank you again to all the attendees today uh, for your attention to this very important topic. Um, I will just remind you that the rounds have been recorded and a link will be sent out in the next couple of days in a follow-up email and will also be linked to the Central East Strip Network website. Uh, the handouts will also be part of that as well. Um, so thank you again and uh, wish everyone a great day. Please do your evaluations and for the person who is asking about aphasia, I refer you to the Aphasia Institute. All right. Please.
evaluations. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.